Okay, so let's start. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Good, good afternoon and good evening. <laughs> Thank you all for coming to this RSMED Zoom webinar on COVID-19 and neurovascular complications. My name is Yulin Ji, New York University uh, School of Medicine and uh, the current president of uh, RSMED. I'm happy to co-chair this meeting with uh, Dr. Mei-Yun Wang, who is going to um, briefly speak about this meeting uh, after me. So on behalf of RSMVD Society, I would like to welcome you wherever you are and what time you are to join this meeting. The RSMVD, or International Society for Neurovascular Disease, is a relatively young society. Actually, this year is uh, its uh, 10th anniversary. And because of COVID-19, we moved our a 10th annual meeting to next year in New York City with the meeting topic on vascular contributions to healthy aging and dementia. The final date has not been um, decided yet, but it will be soon and please check on our website for the updated information. So as you can see, actually, uh, Dr. Heike, Dr. Zambani, and Dr. Zivadinov, who are happy and speaking at this webinar, are all past uh, RSMVD president. So the society's mission is to advance both clinical and basic research in neurovascular, neurodegenerative, and neuropsychiatric disease that are all related, either micro or microvascular abnormalities. The society is also dedicated to the dissemination and the review of new concepts in etiopathology, novel diagnostic, diagnostics, and the therapeutic strategies in various uh, neurovascular disease. The society holds a webinar and a workshop like this regularly. Again, please check on our website for more details. So today, Dr. Paolo uh, Zamboni and also Dr. Zivadinov going to moderate our speaker sessions. So Dr. Paolo Zamboni is a professor Chair of Vascular Surgery and Program Director of the School uh, of Vascular Surgery University uh, Ferrara in Italy. Dr. Zivadinov is a Professor of Neurology, Director Translational Imaging Center at the Clinical Translational Research Center uh, in Buffalo University. And uh, Dr. Mei-Yun Wang, who co chair with me, is a Professor and Chair of the Medical Imaging Center of Henan Province and the Chair of the Department of Radiology uh, of Henan uh, Pro Province People's Hospital in China. And uh, so thank you all again and enjoy the meeting. So maybe is going to you know, introduce a little bit about the, um, this meeting. Maybe please. Thank you, Yini. Hello everyone, welcome to the webinar meeting held by the International Society for Neurovascular Disease. This is Ming Wang from the Henan Provincial People's Hospital of China. I'm very honored to co-chair this meeting with Professor Yuling. This meeting will focus on COVID-19 and neurovascular complications. So as we know, the most common clinical manifestations of COVID-19 are non-specific acute respiratory signs and symptoms. However, with the increasement of case numbers worldwide, more and more studies have reported that a large number of COVID-19 patients have developed into neurological complications, especially in patients with vascular comorbidities. So this webinar meeting will review recent emerging evidence of potential brain damage due to COVID-19 and its implications for diagnosis and long-term effects of the evolving public health crisis. We are very honored to have invited some distinguished experts in the field of neuro to give a talk or share opinions of this meeting. And for example, Dr. Christopher Pomara is a professor of forensic medicine from the Department of Medical Surgical Sciences and Advanced Technology at the University of Catania. 
He will give a talk on COVID-19 deaths. Are we sure it is pneumonia, fighting the form of autopsies? It's a very interesting topic. And we also have Dr. Yuling, Professor of Radiology, New York University, Grossman School of Medicine, the current president of SNVD. He will share with us the topic on vascular comorbidities and neurological complications in patients with COVID-19. And Dr. Imak Haike from the Department of Radiology of Wayne State University. Dr. Haike is a pioneer in the development of new MR technology and image reconstruction. He will give a talk on a comprehensive imaging protocol for neurological sequence in COVID-19 patients. And I will also give a talk on clinical and research experience in COVID-19. In addition, we also have Dr. Paulo Zamboni from University of Ferrara and Dr. Robert Zimardino from Buffalo Neuroimaging Analysis Center and Dr. Eliza Radmanish from New York University and Dr. Nivedita Agrovo from Hospital Rivarat and Dr. Eluteria from Torah University of Trento, who will participate in the panel discussion and share with us their findings and opinions. So this meeting has also received strong support from Henan TV. You can log on to multi new media platforms and APPS like TikTok, Weibo, and such the official account of Henan TV, which is being broadcast live at the same time. Since we have also a lot of Chinese audiences, so please allow me to introduce the name of these new media in Chinese. 本次会议也得到了河南卫视的大力支持，大家可以登录今日头条、西瓜视频、抖音、微博、一直博等搜索河南卫视官方账号，可以看到正在进行的同步直播。so we hope the speeches and the discussions can help us better understand the COVID-19 and its neurovascular complications. And we hope that these findings are helpful and can be used for diagnosis and treatment planning as early as possible. Wish a great success for our meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mayun. <clears throat> and uh, I would like to introduce the first speaker of the day. Uh, which is Mayung Wang, uh, who will speak on, speak on clinical and research experience with COVID-19. Uh, we all know that COVID-19 has really caused a pandemic in the world with dramatic consequences, not just for global health, but also for economy. Uh, and uh, certainly health efforts to determine and discover ways to better uh, uh, diagnose and monitor uh, COVID patients are really important and Eugene plays uh, really uh, a very important role in that. And Dr. Mayun Wang uh, really has had the first-hand experience in uh, diagnosis and research of COVID patients, published a number of uh, really uh, reputable papers recently in JAMA, European Journal of Nuclear Medicine and Molecular Imaging, and she's one of the leaders of really uh, applying multimodal imaging techniques like CT, MRI, PET-CT uh, to uh, really study uh, neurological uh, uh, consequences uh, and symptoms uh, in COVID patients. With, uh, without further ado, I would like to uh, invite uh, Mei Yun to uh, uh, share the screen and present uh, this first topic. Thank you very much, Robert, for the introduction. Okay, I'm going to share my screen with you. Can you see my screen? Yes, yes. Great, so uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Uh, it's my, uh, this is Mei Wang from Henan Provincial People's Hospital in China. It's my great honor to give a talk here. So as a radiologist, I would like to share our clinical and research experience in COVID-19 in China. So as you know, up to today, the pandemic of COVID-19 has involved more than 216 countries and regions and caused over 9 million confirmed cases and 400 sudden deaths. So early detection, diagnosis, isolation, and treatment 
as the keys for prevention and control of COVID-19. And imaging examinations play an important role in the early detection and diagnosis of COVID-19. So the preferred method of imaging examination for COVID-19 are usually chest X-ray or CT. Bedside chest X-ray is used for critical patients. And the chest CT is more sensitive than X-ray in early detection and diagnosis of COVID-19. So according to the chest CT findings of COVID-19, it can be divided into four phases, including early phase, advanced phase, severe phase, and absorption phase. So the typical CT findings of COVID-19 at early phase are solitary or multiple ground glass or peak cities, or short for GGO lesions in single or bilateral lungs, predominantly located in subpleural area. And some GGO lesions have halo sign or reverse halo sign consolidations, crazy paving sign, air broker gram dilation vessels in the lesions. So these are typical CT findings of COVID-19 patient at early stage. We can see multiple GGO lesions in the lungs with the air broker gram and the crazy paving sign and the cosy consolidation. Uh, so this sign we can see that which are typical for the COVID-19. And at advanced pace, usually CT shows in light lesion and or new emerging lesions in the lung. And the predominant lesions are GGO lesions and the consolidations with or without fibrosis bond. So in this case, at advanced phase, we can see the diffuse GGO lesions in bilateral lungs with crazy paving sign and air bronchogram and new emerging subpleural lesions in the lung, like this lesion. And at severe phase, the typical CD findings are diffuse consolidations in bilateral lungs with air bronchogram in it. Wet lung can be seen when most of the lungs are involved. Actually, wet lung is a typical finding of COVID-19 at a severe phase. Sometimes we can also see GGO lesions, thickened pleural or mild pleural effusion. These are typical CD findings of severe COVID-19 patients, which shows a bilateral wet lung with air bronchogram in it. So this is very typical, which means a severe phase of COVID-19 patients. However, at the uh, absorption phase, CT shows reduction in the size and number of GGO lesions and more fibrosis bonds and the bronchoactylactrosis. So in this case, the typical CD findings at absorption phase usually include the absorption of the GGO lesions and the more fibrosis like this and bronchoactylactrosis like this. So CT is not only important in the diagnosis of COVID-19, but also in the evaluating of progression of lesions. Then how about the progression of COVID-19 patients? Let's look at some COVID-19 cases of our hospital. So this is a 20 years old male who is a mild case. The first CT scan demonstrates a GGO lesion here located in the paravertebral area of the right lower lobe which is hard to be detected by the chest s And four days later, the lesion enlarged. And 10 days later, the lesion showed absorption. And finally, 13 days later, the lesion was absorbed almost completely. So usually the complete absorption of lesions occurs in most of the mild cases. But for the severe or critical cases, disease progression may be different. So this is a 51 years old female who was a severe case. So from the series of follow-up CT, we can see that the changes of lesion. On the first CT scan, we can see no lesions in the CT uh, scan in the lung. But the second time, we can see a GGO lesion here. So from negative to positive. And then, the GGO lesion enlarged, and then the lesion has absorption. Uh, but there is some uh, fibrosis here. 
So this is a typical progression for severe or critical cases. Usually, fibrosis is more common in severe or critical COVID-19 cases, which may last very long time. As a radiologist, we can not only help the diagnosis and evaluation of COVID-19 in clinical work, but also can help on investigating the epidemiological characteristics, pathogenesis, and assessment of systematic organ involvement. So I'd like to talk about some related research we have done on COVID-19. For example, we have firstly reported the transmission from an asymptomatic carrier in a family cluster in China, which was published in JAMA in February. So in this report, a family cluster of five patients with COVID-19 uh, pneumonia were analyzed. The first case is an asymptomatic carrier who was confirmed positive for COVID-19 by nucleic acid test, but the CT finding in the lung was negative which means no lenses in the lung for this patient. But she had traveled back from the epidemic center of Wuhan and then contacted the other family members. And all the other five family members have, have had symptoms and their chest CT were positive. So this report suggests that a symptomatic carrier can also be infectious and the CT can evaluate if there's a lung lesion in the asymptomatic carrier. A nucleic acid test result is a golden diagnosis standard for asymptomatic carrier. So we also reported a COVID-19 patient with a positive test of virus nucleic, nucleic acid in fecal specimen, but negative test results on multiple pharyngeal samples which indicates that the virus can proliferate in the digestive tract and potentially undergo fecal oral transmission. So this report was published in American Journal of Gastroenterology. Based on our experience, we have also summarized the CT characteristics of 56 confirmed COVID-19 patients and shared the findings by publishing a paper in European Radiology in March. It should be helpful for global radiologists in the diagnosis and differential diagnosis of COVID-19. And as the COVID-19 pandemic has lasted for about half a year, more and more evidence showed that COVID-19 can not only involve lung, but also may involve the other organs. Then how to evaluate if the other organs or symptoms is involved or affected? How about the prognosis of recovered COVID-19 patients? Some advanced imaging techniques should be helpful. For example, PET-CT is a good technique in evaluating the systematic organ involvements. And we have collected and analyzed some PET-CT data of recovered COVID-19 patients. For example, in this COVID-19 case, the PET-CT was performed 20 days after symptom onset when the two consecutive results of nucleic acid tests were negative. So the chest CT shows consolidations uh, in the lung, uh, bilateral lower lungs, and the cor uh, corresponding PET CT image shows increased uptake uh, in the lung lesion. And the Mediastium CT image shows a normal uh, mediastium lymph node, but the PET image just shows the increased uptake in the lymph node. And also in the uh, liver and spleen, the PET image shows the increased uptake in the liver and spleen as well. So PET CT imaging revealed increased metabolic activity in residual pulmonary lesions and uh, many astinal lymph nodes, spleen, and liver, which may indicate persisting inflammation in these tissues beyond the negative status conferred by PCR test. This is a key finding that may help shed light on subsequent processes taking place in recovered patients. 
PET-CT examinations were repeated in the same patient after 113 days later. So this is a follow-up PET-CT image on the same patient. Compared with the PET-CT of last time, we found that not only the size of GGU laser in the lung was obviously decreased, but also the uptick of the uh, fluoro 18 FDG in the lung laser is decreased, and the uh, mediastinal lymph node is also decreased with the lower uptick of FDG. And also, but the uptick of liver here shows further increase than previous pedicity, and the uptick of the spleen is decreased. So these results suggest that the uptick of fluoro 18 FDG in lung lesions, lymph nodes may decrease with time, which may indicate the absorption of lesions, but it's unknown why the uptick of fluoro 18 FDG in liver was increased with time. We may need a more data to do further analysis. Besides the PET-CT, PET-MR can also be used to observe the systemic organ involvement of COVID-19 with better soft tissue re resolution. So this is a 57 years old man with mild COVID-19. PET-CT and PET-MR images were obtained 13 days after symptom onset. And the PET-CT images of lung demonstrate mild GGU lesions here and bonds in lung without increased metabolic activity on PET image. Uh, so we didn't see the increased uptake here. And the normal sized lymph nodes in the mediastinum, but with increased metabolic activity was seen too. Here, the lymph node shows increased uptake. And the sign sequences of heart showed that the cardiac structure is normal with no increased FTG uptake. And MI and the PET scans with the other organs like the brain, like the liver, yielded similar results with no remarkable changes in the anatomy and the metabolism of the brain and spleen. And as for the liver, MI images indicated no remarkable changes in anatomy. Uh, but the PET images shows diffuse increased FDG uptake. So that's the PETMAR imaging findings. So this result was published by us in European Journal of Nuclear Medicine and Molecular Imaging, uh, which is the first report of PETMAR on COVID-19 patients in the world. This is uh, uh, Panama or another uh, case. The result uh, is, is a 55 year old man with critical COVID-19. And the Panama image is obtained 125 days after the symptom onset. So there appears uh, in the brain that there's no abnormality in the brain of the recurrent COVID-19 patients. And, uh, Coronal lung CT shows the patchy GGO lesions and the reticular shadow in bilateral lungs. And the coronal lung MRI UTE shows patch hyperintensity here. And the PET image shows slightly increased fluoro 18 FDG uptake in the lung lesions. This is the PETMA uh, fusion image, uh, which also shows the um, slightly increased FDG uptake here. So uh, this is uh, from the uh, liver PETMI image. Uh, so there is no abdom abnormality in the liver and kidney in the recovered COVID-19 patient. Then how about the brain changes in recovered COVID-19 patients? So this Brain MR images were collected from a recovered COVID-19 patient, and these were from the volunteer. So based on our analysis, the brain structure has no changes in recovered COVID-19 patient. But 
when we analyze the uterine spin labyrinth data of the brain, we found that the global mean cerebral blood flow of the whole brain in the COVID-19 patients was significantly increased compared with the controls here. It may be a compensatory response to brain hypoxia and reduced cerebral with a dilatory capacity. And ACLMI also revealed the increased the regional cerebral blood flow in the olfactory sensory motor and default mode networks, uh, including some areas like olfactory cortex uh, and the insular cortex and so on. So the increased CBF in olfactory or cortex, insular and the sensory motor area may be attributed to the recovery of olfactory and uh, taste function in the recovered COVID-19 patients. We also found that the global mean CBF was significantly correlated with the hemoglobin concentration in peripheral blood in the recovered COVID-19 patients here, which may reflect compensatory mechanisms to brain hypoxia and reduced cerebral with the deletery capacity. As COVID-19 has influenced, influenced the clinical work in hospital very much, we also have called on specialists, including neurosurgeon, neurologists, and neuroradiologists of SMVD and the Chinese Federation of Intervention and Therapeutic Neuroradiology to publish an expert consensus on prevention and control of COVID-19 in neurointerventional surgery based on our working experience in fighting against the COVID-19. So this expert consensus was published in General Neurointerventional Surgery, which provides the protective strategies and recommendations for medical staff to carry out neurointerventional procedures under the circumstances of the COVID-19 epidemic. And the references for neurointerventional physicians around the world. So we also participated in a multi artificial intelligence study on COVID-19. In this study, we retrospectively collected 5,372 patients with computed thermography images from seven cities or provinces. The deep learning system achieved good performance in identifying COVID-19 from the other pneumonia. Moreover, the deep learning system succeeded to stratify patients into high-risk and low-risk groups whose hospital stay time have a significant difference. We have also read, written books or image atlas of COVID-19 in Chinese and English version, respectively. These two books will be published very soon. Hopefully, they will be helpful for the clinical and research work on prevention and control of COVID-19 in the world. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Mayun, for a wonderful presentation. Uh, I remind everybody who are attending to uh, post their uh, questions on the, to the chat uh, and the QA. Uh, uh, section and I invite my co-moderator Professor Zamboni to proceed introducing uh, Dr. Pomara. Thank you Robert. It's my privilege to introduce Cristoforo Pomara as a professor of forensic medicine in the University of Catania in Italy. His speech is about is a COVID-19 death are we sure it is pneumonia? Findings from autopsies. Thank you, Cristoforo. Thank you, moderator. Thank you very much. I'm very honored to be here with you. And today I will try immediately to share my screen with you. Okay. Can you see the screen? Yes. Thank you. So today I would like to share with you, first of all, 
my opinion about the autopsy in this field is a new topic for every one of us, I think. And of course, the new way to perform this kind of autopsy, and then obviously uh, the small results coming out from our first research in this field. But first of all, I would like to start with a question. It's a simple question. Uh, it's a old question. It was posed for the first time uh, by chest by Dr. Edwards. And the question is, the autopsy, do we still need it? I think as a scientist, we need to ask ourselves hey, we, uh, if we need or not the autopsy. As you can see on the right side of the slide, uh, it's presented a clear decline of autopsy rate from USA since 1972 to 1944, and nowadays it's the same, actually the same, except for the yellow line, which is related to the unnatural deaths, which means the forensic autopsies. Uh, we have a constant numbers of forensic autopsy all over the world, and probably that's the reason because I'm going to give this talk with you as a forensic pathology. But answering to the questions, probably, obviously, my opinion is really clear. Of course, for me, we need the autopsy to understand mechanism, to understand the cause of that, to understand the pathophysiology of a new pathology like the ones we are going to discuss today all together. But uh, probably mine is a minority position, if it's real, that it's possible to see the position of Royal College of Pathology in the briefing on COVID-19 in February 2020, in which they declare, as you can see on the bottom of the slides with the red line, that if death is believed to be due to confirm COVID-19 infection, there is unlikely to be any need for a post-mortem examination to be conducted on the medical certificate of cause of death should be used. That means that probably autopsy, it's, you know, confined exclusively to the, uh, you know, to the right certificate of death, but I don't think it's the right way to understand the meaning of the autopsy. And probably it's one of the reasons because in 2015, they declare in UK extinct the uh, clinical autopsy practice, not the forensic. Same experiences we have in Netherlands, in which in the last past decades, they declare a percentage of 0 0.7 per calendar year. And obviously, even uh, in this experience, forensic cutopsy rates did not decline. Why I'm stressing this data with you? Because something similar is happening nowadays with the COVID pathology. Why? We perform a literature review it's going to be published uh, the Journal of Clinical Medicine, uh, in which the results are the ones you can see in the slides. Uh, about 24,618 papers related to COVID. But if we search for the words autopsy or biopsy inside this paper, the number decreased to 1,028.5. And if we search for the word autopsy, then they match only 101 results. And about this, we only have 31 articles with autopsy data. Uh, of a total of 227 autopsies were reported, we only have in the literature 58 full autopsies that were described on a global number of deaths, around 47 to 1,000 and more of them. And what is interest, interesting is, you know, that obviously, even in the approach of the autopsy with a different kind, minimally biopsy, bioptical study, uh, organ type, we had only a, a description uh, of some organs, in particular, 28%, as you can see, uh, were concentrated on the study on the respiratory tract, while the decline of the percentage still, for example, 4% of vascular growth examination, as well as nervous system holding in 10%. 
Even histological data uh, present the same results, 30% related to respiratory study, and only, for example, 2.5% to vascular examination, as well as 7.6% to the nervous system. About the cause of death, about the cause of death, we have these results. So 35% was related to uh, thromboembolies, 24% respiratory failures, and 41% they only were related to the uh, infection, so in generally presentation of infection. Does this mean that we are unable to collect all the full data coming from autopsy? Many governments uh, discourage the use of autopsy practice or, or practice all over the world. For example, in Italy, despite the great action of our government to face the epidemic, the uh, Ministry of Health, uh, with this circular, is in Italian, I can try to translate for you, they declare that during the acute phase of uh, uh, emergency, it should not be performed forensic as clinical autopsy. So we are experiencing in Italy the incredible situation that despite the thousands of deaths, almost no autopsies, only 38 for now. Uh, being to go are going to be published uh, as now as the better of my knowledge. But the autopsy, the autopsy, I think it has to be affirmed that is the gold standard that we have to study the cause of death, the correct cause of death, as well as the pathophysiology. I think that uh, uh, the cock is completely right. Collection of specimen from cadaver can be useful in the control of disease outbreak. And this is very important because we need to outline the rule of autopsy because uh, it's need in the clinical, in the education, and in the, in the epidemiological valuation of a new uh, pathology like the one we are discussing. And 100% uh, agree with Dr. Bart, who launched a call to action to need for autopsy, to perform the complete autopsy to study all the organs that we have to study, all the organs that we have to study. Obviously, obviously, the problem, uh, it should be the safety, obviously, is a problem and we need to have the proper autopsy room. This is my, uh, the, 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 the autopsy room we have at uh, the hospital in, in Catania is in uh, negative pressure, uh, but uh, it's also simple, for example, to have a biocontainment room in which we can do the uh, correct autopsy and we, in which we can have the safety uh, uh, measurements uh, respected. Obviously, the, one, the most important things uh, that I want to share with you is that for uh, the pathologists, for forensic or clinical pathology, they, they must be, uh, they, 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 they keep uh, their attention essential uh, with the personal protective equipment. It's nothing different by the clinician experience. Those are the only instruments that can protect the individuals working on the uh, autopsy room. I uh, would like to share with you the first result of a study we are conducting in our um, autoptical room. It's very impressive uh, for me, the results, because we uh, perform a lot of what's face, what's face men, uh, on the table, in different parts of the table room, obviously on the organs, but even on the floor where we work it, and the results were this that time uh, sharing with you. Uh, we have a positive uh, reaction to the presence of RNA, viral RNA, uh, both in the airways of the cadavers, in the face shield, in the table, as well as in the autopsy room floor. But after uh, all the procedure of sterilization, obviously it calls come down and results are uh, absolutely uh, good to work. So, Obviously, we need to keep our attention to perform this autopsy, but uh, once that we know the why, the way, and once that we share the correct way to do, 
uh, it's necessary to promote, I think, in my opinion, it's necessary to promote the autopsy practice. We started and, you know, the, 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 in the presentation before this one, it was demonstrated. We started thinking that it was, you know, a, a coronavirus and so uh, it was related to uh, respiratory symptoms, fever, cough, but now we have, uh, you know, the hypothesis and we, uh, we are we, we are 100% uh, convinced that the pathology is a systemic pathology. And even the results from our first autopsy and the autopsy uh, published all over the world uh, move in this direction all the results. For example, uh, we, I, I present with you, I, I'm going to present with you three simple cases, only three cases uh, that, that we studied in, uh, in Catania and Forgia in, in Torino. Uh, it's very impressive uh, uh, to know that uh, it depends on the uh, cause of death. They have uh, a common pathway of lesion. Here I concentrate on lungs, but um, what is easy to see is the change in shape, uh, the weight, and uh, the lungs uh, of the lungs with the, this massive edema, it's macroscopically evident that there is a massive edema, a change of the uh, parenchyma. But uh, what is very interesting is uh, the histological examination. The histological examination revealed reveal the presence of microthrombus everywhere. So this microthrombus surrounding lung tissue, vascular and uh, microvascular uh, vascularization of the lungs. And even when we have a predominant partners of uh, alveolar uh, expansive or ruptures of the septal, we also have the fibrinous exudates everywhere in all the specimen we study. Even the immunohistochemical study confirmed the reaction, the perivasal reaction, with the positive reaction to different antibodies, and in particular, it's very interesting, the CD8. It's very interesting because we have the positive reaction of the ACE2, the factor 8, the interleukin, and the TNF alpha. And in this case, you see the microscopic cross examination of the lung. It appears like a uh, uh, honeycomb of the parenchyma, which is confirmed to the histological study here. You can see the red cells everywhere, rupture of the septa and larger high space. This is acute rupture of the septum. Here is the edema, it's the massive edema. But what is very interesting is that if we do the same study at the brain level, we can discover the presence of the microthrombi within the small vessels. The detachment of the vessels from the parenchyma, which is usually we associate these lesions to an hypoxic acute lesion. It is very interesting to note that here we have this spherical corpse, this formed formation with a black arrow, and we can hypothesize that this is the virus presence. The confirm comes over with the immunohistochemical examination. If you can reach the CD8 in the brain findings at the immunohistochemical examination, means that the virus is there. Means that the virus can go over the vessels, through the vessels into the parenchyma. And here, the reaction with CD3 confer all over in the parenchyma that there was a reaction. Why I share with you the first, my first results? Because probably 
the hypothesis should be that uh, that the hypothesis we suppose with my colleagues in a recent contribution, we suppose that probably, and there are the first confirm, the angiotensin converting enzyme too um, is probably a door, a gate for the virus, but everywhere, because through the endothelial, it can go everywhere uh, uh, in the organs. And that's probably because many organs are interested by the lesion. Obviously, uh, we need to, uh, to understand better uh, what's happening inside our corp. Uh, different personal genetic background, probably. Cappello recently proposed uh, a molecular mimicry that may explain a multi-organ damage in COVID-19. And that is supported by the different individual susceptibility even to the therapeutic strategy. So I think that once again, um, I'm going to conclude my talk. Uh, I think once again that we need to perform complete autopsy to better understand the mechanism. Uh, we need to perform the genetic test, we need to perform immunohistochemical test, uh, electronic microscopic, and we need to uh, defend the virus with all the tools we can, uh, we can have nowadays. Um, I declare a missed opportunity, mm, the, the the decline of autopsy rate uh, all over the world in this pandemic. And I'm strongly convinced that uh, as a scientific community, as I wrote, uh, we're called uh, on to face this global threat and defeat it with uh, all available tools necessary. Uh, and the lesson, we, we need to you know, remember the all lessons inherited from pioneers of medicine about the uh, autopsy. Despite modern technology, despite modern instruments, it remains the gold standard of the study of uh, autopsy. And that's the way we have uh, all together to uh, complete uh, with the autopsy uh, the puzzle uh, of medicine uh, and it's very important uh, to understand this and I hope to see an increase, a drastic increase of uh, reports on literature to, uh, on, uh, about the autopsy. So please uh, take home messages, promote in your country, in your institution, uh, the autopsy practice with the safety uh, measurements obviously, but promote it autopsy, autopsy, autopsy. I would like to thank all of you, and in particular, all the staff is cooperating with me in this interesting new field of forensic pathology. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Cristoforo. And thank you for your very elegant and impressive uh, uh, presentation. A question and answer will be at the end of the session. And so, Robert, we may uh, move forward, I think. Thank you. Thank you, Paolo. So uh, we are getting to the third lecture <coughs> by our president, uh, Professor Yi, uh, which is focused on vascular comorbidities and neurological complications in patients with COVID-19. He will focus particularly on the roots uh, of uh, clearly uh, by which uh, COVID-19 uh, may enter the central nervous system and uh, possible uh, mechanisms. Uh, Yulin? Yulin, you are uh, muted. Uh, you have to unmute yourself, Yulin. Hi, hello everyone. Can you hear me right now? Yes, we do. Okay, great. So, um, yeah, it is great pleasure to give this presentation, you know, with uh, the um, not ongoing, still ongoing pandemic and still rising cases. I feel there is an urgent need to draw society's uh, awareness and also attention 
of the coronavirus impact on neuronal and vascular system. So in this uh, you know, presentation, I will describe the most recent findings associated with uh, neuro uh, neurological you know, complications along with some data and evidence about uh, vascular comorbidities and their role in brain in injury. While well, also discussing several possible uh, neuroinvasive uh, pathways of the virus. So let me see if I can move forward. Okay. So yeah, this is the yesterday's coronavirus uh, dashboard from Johns Hopkins showing over 9 million confirmed cases worldwide in uh, 188 countries and almost half a million people died from this uh, virus. And these numbers are still you know, uh, climbing every day. So oftentimes you know, people compared with um, the uh, influenza uh, viruses. So the SARS-CoV-2 or you know, the COVID-19 uh, has higher fractions of severe and critical infections with 15% being severe cases requiring oxygen and five being uh, critical cases requiring uh, ventilation at ICU. So unlike uh, influenza, the children are less likely to be affected, but instead older patients with underlying medical conditions have a higher risk of getting severe illness or poor outcome. So this virus also has higher neurological uh, involvement compared to the influenza virus. So let me minimize my screen here. Um, as shown here, so the majority of the uh, COVID-19 cases result in uh, mild symptoms, just like a flu, running nose, dry cough, and a low grade fever. Um, and can recover by itself. About 20% of cases move to the advanced stage. Unlike the uh, bacterial pneumonia, this virus affects the entire lungs and uh, about 5% cases can progress to acute the uh, respiratory distress syndrome due to the inflammation and uh, massive inflammation and increased fluid uh, causing multiple organ fail uh, due to the hypoxia. So this can be progressing very quickly within uh, a month. Depends on the person's, you know, um, the condition. And uh, causing the higher morbidity uh, and mortality. So the SARS-CoV-2 also called a COVID-19. Uh, primarily affects the uh, lungs, and, uh, but uh, it also affects uh, the other organs, such as heart, blood vessels, brain, and kidneys. About one third of the coronavirus uh, cases have neurological symptoms, including the uh, ischemic stroke and uh, hemorrhage and seizures. And recently, the um, neurotrophic, neurotropic and uh, neuroinvasive capability of the coronavirus have drawn a lot of attention, which um, contrasts from the uh, exposure uh, of the influenza uh, virus with much less neuronal involvement. Today, I'm going to focus on the brain and the vascular complications related to the coronavirus uh, infections. So this is my outline. So briefly, I'm going to talk about the neurological science and symptoms and the vascular comorbidities, and mainly about the mechanism of the neuronal complications. And uh, you know, towards the end, I'm going to talk about uh, some uh, imaging studies uh, done from the uh, New York University uh, Medical Center uh, and uh, finally, a few words on the future studies. So the coronavirus can cause uh, you know, both flow-like uh, symptoms and also the nervous system uh, indications and complications. The headache, uh, dizziness uh, being the most commonly reported. In addition, 
uh, one third to two third people reported altered sense of smell and taste, which is considered uh, an early sign of the coronavirus infection. Acute cerebral vascular events such as in infarct, brain hemorrhage, and uh, the um, the seizures are also reported in the se severe cases. Usually, the severe the neurological events emerge two to three weeks after acute ARDS and contribute higher mortality rate. So based on the, you know, the, the literature and uh, you know, some studies suggestions, we propose kind of like a four uh, pathways of neuroinvasive invasion uh, by the uh, coronavirus. So, Route 1 is a direct transcranial pathway through the olfactory nerve infection directly transmitted to the brain. Route 2 is a hematogenous neuroinvasion through the brain, uh, causing the brain damage, mainly caused by the body's cytokine storm or the immune, immune uh, reactions. Road three is through a trigger for an exacerbation of pre-existing cerebral vascular conditions. This trigger is AC2. And uh, road four is a hypoxic neural injury from the ARDS, which is a hypoxic neuronal injury. So, for the, uh, most of the uh, respiratory uh, viruses, nasal cavity is their first uh, incubating place where the virus reproduce and replicate. A large viral load can be found in this region. This is also where the nasal swabs is performed for the testing virus. About uh, one third to two third patients experience a sudden loss of smell which is considered the first sign of the uh, COVID-19. Luckily, the loss of smell is not permanent. So the, you will, when you lose the 20 to 30% of factory nerve cells killed by the uh, coronavirus, you will have a loss of sense of smell. And these cells are within nasal epithelium. So loss of the smell does not mean your brain is if, if infected, as shown here. So mainly affecting this region, the, uh, the, the virus. So whether the virus can go, you know, along the, along the, um, the uh, olfactory nerve and olfactory uh, epithelial neurons uh, to into the brain, in coronavirus is still uh, unknown right now. There's no direct evidence to show that. So in order to test whether the olfactory bulb is affected or not, so the, this study using the high resolution 2D and 3D um, T2 weighted imaging to scan the olfactory bulb and also the uh, nasal cavity and uh, 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 around the, uh, in the, the region of the uh, olfactory nerves. We can see the, the signal intensity in the olfactory bulb is, appears normal, which indicates there's no obvious um, the infection uh, by the virus in this uh, um, olfactory bulb. Even though there is inflammatory changes uh, in these um, small olfactory uh, clefts which are two narrow passages to the, um, you know, around the, the olfactory nerve located at the upper part of the nasal cavity. So, so far there's no direct evidence that uh, SARS-CoV-2 can invade a brain through this uh, olfactory pathway, but uh, definitely this is um, area need to be um, further uh, explored. So the road two 
is related to the uh, hematogenous um, neural invasion. So, and uh, we know there is some studies reported the cytokine storm, which is defined as an overreaction by a robust, healthy immune system through this cytokine messengers to cause an attack to a trigger such as a virus, not only the trigger, but also to body's own cells. So the cytokine can pass BBB and attacks cells, neuronal cells. And also it can attack blood vessels causing increased blood uh, leakage and also blood clots throughout the body. So the massive, massive the storm induced uh, encephalopathy is uh, seen and reported. This is one case uh, from um, the uh, Detroit, uh, the Henry Ford, I think. So the group, and they reported um, bilateral, you know, thalamus and also temporal lobe hyperintensity in the COVID-19 positive patient. But not many cases have been reported showing this kind of uh, uh, appearance. Uh, all the um, this kind of uh, encephalopathy, uh, the pathology. So this is because the by definition the cytokine storm is marked by a robust immune system attacking normal body tissues. Individuals lacking. Uh, strong immune system like the elderly and and the immuno or surprised people will like likely not experience a cytokine storm another theory related to the uh, hematogenous uh, neural invasion is the direct uh, you know invasion invasion of the virus uh, in to the neurons and uh, the csf as uh, you know dr pamara mentioned the ACE2 receptor is also found in the brain. So the, uh, the, the virus is likely to you know, attach to the uh, ACE2 um, the director. And, uh, and also the studies found the coronavirus in the both CSF and the postmortem brain capillary uh, endotheliums and neuronal cells. The row three is uh, related to the uh, hu human angiotensin converting enzyme 2, ACE2 triggering. ACE2 is the gateway for the coronavirus to enter the cells. So the ACE2 is found in many organs, such as lungs, the GI tract, kidneys, vessels, and brain. And also it has uh, not important, uh, not only, it is not only important for it's the kind of the doorway to for the um, virus to get in the, into the cells. It has also implications for vascular comorbidities and the new therapeutic strategies. So only by biting this, the, uh, biting the, uh, it's a spike protein to ACC2 uh, receptor, the coronavirus can into to the to the to the cells as showing as showing here, this is the as a spike protein. This is the is to uh, on the cell uh, membrane, and also is two is related to the well established uh, angiotensin renin, uh, you know the uh, the system, as showing here. Um, we know in this cascade, renin converts. Angiotensinogen angio angio to angiotensin 1. And ACE convert angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. And angiotensin 2 has a lot of bad effects. One is it can moderate the uh, aldosterone in kidney to increase the blood pr the pressure. And also, it can it is a strong vessel constrictor, causing hypertension and also the lung fibrosis. However, 
the we know the uh, ACE2 can convert angiotensin 2 to angiotensin 1 and 7. Angiotensin 1 and 7 has a positive uh, if a good effect on the cells okay? because it can cause the vessel dilation and has anti-inflammation and anti-oxidant uh, oxidation effects. And also in the meantime, when the, the active AC2, when the AC2 is active, it causes you know, met metabolism more angiotensin 2 and lead to less in the uh, bad, bad effects from the angiotensin 2. So once the, the coronavirus binds to the, um, the ACE2, ACE it can downgrade or degrade the ACE2, the receptors. So then give you, once the ACE2 is decreased, as shown here, it is it, it do, it doing a good job to maintain the health of the cells. If it's decreased, it has all the bad effects going to uh, increase. In the meantime, the, um, the vascular permeability increased with the edema and the pneumonia we can see in the lungs. So by blocking you know, several places in, in the, this uh, pathway and also this, uh, um, the binding site uh, using the uh, angiotensin receptor blocker and also this uh, um, the enzyme and also the ACE um, inhibitor, it can reduce the, the side effects from the coronavirus. So that there is some uh, therapeutic implications um, of this uh, ACE2 triggering mechanism. So there's a more story on the ACE2, which is uh, um, ACE2 protects endothelial function and prevent atherosclerosis uh, formation. Studies has also found uh, degraded ACE2 will cause oxidative stress, endothelial dysfunction, and uh, also, you know, causing the increased uh, von Willebrand factors. We know this is the clotting the factors. It can cause the uh, thrombosis. When this uh, large amount of thrombosis happened, there's also the uh, thrombocytopenia and uh, then can lead to the hemorrhage. So this is why the patients with underlying vascular comorbidities tend to have poor outcome. Because if a patient already had underlying vascular problems, this virus will make them worse through the ACE2 pathways. So study has suggested the severity of the COVID-19 infection is not only associated with uh, these factors, common factors you know, mentioned, uh, like age, uh, immunocompromised, chronic medical conditions, conditions like uh, lung, kidney, and liver disease, and obesity. And the pre-existing vascular comorbidities, such as hypertension, chronic infarction, heart disease, can also uh, have uh, dramatic effects on these uh, virus infections. So this is early studies from the uh, January to March. So these studies uh, showed the most prevalent uh, comorbidity uh, in patients with COVID-19 is hypertension, diabetes, and other cardio, uh, cerebrovascular disease. On admission, 10 to 50% patients having two or more comorbidities. And if you have more comorbidities, the death rate was significantly higher, like two or three, two to, uh, two to three times higher. So 
more recently, uh, a study published in JAMA reviewed data from 5,700 patients who were hospitalized with COVID-19 in New York City area. This showed the comparison data of vascular and uh, versus uh, respiratory risk factors. Surprisingly, much higher number of hospitalized COVID patients have pre-existing vascular, um, like hypertension and cardiac you know, problems than having pre-existing um, respiratory conditions such, such as asthma and uh, COPD. Also, the percentage of COVID patients who are chronic smokers are surprisingly low in several studies reported. In one study, it's only 1.4% um, of the COVID patients, positive patients, uh, are smokers, compared to, you know, in general, 50% smokers in China uh, in men. And uh, in France, they also found relatively low instant uh, rate of the smokers uh, see in the uh, COVID positive patients. Again, these studies, sorry, these studies needed to uh, be um, further uh, valid, validated. And, uh, but uh, it gives some indication that the role of vascular risk factor is uh, obvious and dramatic in these patients. So the road fall is related to chronic uh, hypoxia neuronal injury. Yulin, uh, I would just like to remind you that you have uh, about one to two minutes to conclude, please. Oh, sorry, I have to speed it up, sorry. So the, um, the, the road fall is related to the chronic hypoxia neuronal injury. You know, as Dr. Pamara mentioned, the, the virus in, uh, induced the diffuse alveolar and interstitial uh, inflammation edema leading to uh, the chronic hypo hypoxia. As shown in this figure, we can see, uh, you know, the, the, because the membrane and the, the thickening and also the edema causing the dramatic, uh, the um, exchange rate of the oxygen is uh, decreased. And the, um, also the, uh, you know, the uh, oxygen, saturation rate is decreasing. But in the early age, in early stage, like a less than two weeks, only mild neuronal injury from hypoxia uh, is found. This is probably due to the uh, vessel uh, dilation from the hypoxia and increased blood flow as uh, Dr. Min Wang mentioned. And uh, late stage, uh, like over two weeks, there is a diffuse white matter uh, leuco encephalopathy um, uh, was found, and with the cell swelling, edema, demyelination, blood brain barrier breakdown. So this is similar to the delayed uh, post-hypoxia uh, leukoencephalopathy, BPHL, which is also related to the hypoxic injury. So uh, in the next few slides, I'm going to present uh, the, uh, some imaging uh, work done by uh, Dr. Uh, Ren Manish uh, from my institution, uh, New York University Medical Center. So this is, you know, the uh, slides are based on the several studies he uh, published. So this is the first uh, uh, paper published on AJR. There are two, uh, 240, uh, 242 uh, COVID-19 patients uh, underwent uh, CT or MR of brain within two weeks of the positive uh, the testing. And uh, the mean age is uh, 68.7, uh, and 231 inpatients and 11 outpatients. So um, the immediate findings, uh, the most common is non-specific white matter uh, hyperintensities or the uh, microangiopathy. Uh, and uh, also the, uh, the chronic infarct, infarct acute subacute uh, ischemic infarct was found and also the hemorrhage. So as shown here, so they are all the old, you can see the old folks and with uh, pre uh, you know, condition, um, the pre-existing conditions of the uh, different disease. So this is uh, kind of uh, consistent with our hypothesis uh, 
of the uh, pathway uh, row four, row three, which is the vascular uh, comorbidities. And uh, the non-specific white matter micro uh, angiopathy, we can see on CT and uh, the um, the MR, they are non-specific, just like you know the age-related changes. But uh, the, in this paper, there is a strong correlation between this um, the uh, the scaled this um, the white matter, you know, the micro angiopathy, and the um, the outcome of the patient. So um, this uh, microangiopathy was graded by the, uh, the scale one is now, scale two is expected for age, and scale three is uh, more than expected for age. This is just a rough uh, correlations, but this is also indicating the uh, vascular comorbidity uh, and its role uh, in the, um, the COVID patients. So another finding is acute subacute infarction as shown here in different patients. So this is also related to the uh, vascular comorbidity uh, we talked about through that pathway. And uh, there is not only the arterial infarction and also the, uh, there is a, a venous thrombosis uh, in the COVID-19 patients reported in another colleague uh, in my institution. And uh, also Dr. Uh, Redmanish, reported um, the 11 patients critically ill COVID uh, pay, the, uh, the cases. So they, are, they were on the uh, mechanical ventilation all the time of the, uh, uh, at, at the time of the imaging and also for a mean duration of the 27 days. And the mean age is uh, 80, 83. Uh, the four patients had only diffuse uh, leukoencephalopathy, which is like uh, the diffuse white matter hyperintensity, and one with only the microblades, and the six with the both, uh, you know, combination of the uh, leukoencephalopathy and also the microblades. And uh, this is uh, associated with the, uh, uh, the chronic hypoxia we proposed. So you can see this, uh, um, the, the images, this is the DWI and ADC, all these cases have increased uh, signal intensities on DWI uh, image and decreased uh, de uh, diffusivity and uh, indicating the cell swelling at this stage and also the hyper intensity on the uh, T2 with the imaging. So this is another case uh, in the, uh, uh, for the lesions in the cerebellum. So different cases all show consistent findings on DWI. It's all increased. So as I said, in indicating um, the, um, the cell swelling with res restricted uh, diffusion, and also seems like DWI is better uh, to delineate the lesions than the T2. So this is uh, similar to the disease of the um, diffuse, uh, of the delayed uh, in the hypoxia, um, the, let me show this, uh, uh, hypoxic uh, leukoencephalopathy, uh, as shown in this image, you can see they are very similar. So indicating the white matter micro, uh, the, the um, angiopathy, all the, the vascular insult happens to the, likely happens to chronic hypoxia uh, injury. So the summary of the imaging findings, the, both the white matter hyperintensities and the uh, acute cerebral vascular events like a, the acute infarction and the hemorrhage are nonspecific. It's related to the pre-existing vascular uh, comorbidities. But this specific, the findings uh, causing the uh, increased uh, DWI signals uh, is more likely due to the hy you know, hypoxia, chronic hypoxia uh, injury. Because in the first studies, you know, those patient cohort is like two weeks after the, the infection. 
we didn't see these uh, clear uh, the patterns. These all the uh, the patterns showing here is uh, critically ill patients uh, with the uh, lower the blood oxygen uh, saturation. Another finding is uh, in these uh, critical ill patients is the uh, microbleeds. We think it's also related to the uh, chronic hypoxia. And interestingly, it's one case, 45 year old, and uh, uh, sorry, uh, 64 year old. Uh, one week before the, the, you know, the current hospital encounter, um, the patient presents a headache, so there's no obvious the micro uh, hemorrhage. But uh, after 23 days, the mechanical ventilation in the hospital, so we can see uh, you know, some of the, um, the micro bleeds at the uh, just uh, cortical and uh, uh, colossal uh, regions. So in summary, the uh, neuroinvasive pathways we think uh, in the COVID-19 patients are more seen related to the ROT3, which is the, you know, the uh, AC2 trigger for um, pre-existing conditions of the uh, cerebrovascular uh, comorbidities. And also the uh, ROT4 hypoxic uh, neuronal injury is also seen uh, commonly. <coughs> so the, uh, the final point is uh, the, um, not only the, the physical and the real neurological you know, damage, psychiatric complications are fast becoming an issue for mild and uh, asymptomatic, uh, asymptomatic patients. These are the numbers collected um, during a follow-up study of almost uh, um, you know, 31 to 50 months after the SARS-CoV-1 happened in uh, uh, 2002. Uh, 54 you know, percent of patients have a PDCSD. Uh, and also during this time, uh, during this you know, COVID-19, you know, people reported uh, also um, kind of uh, 20, uh, uh, 10 to uh, 20, uh, 30 patients have the higher level of uh, anxiety and also the uh, uh, di distress. So the, all this, you know, the uh, caused by the disease related fear, economic stress, social distancing, and also disruption of the, uh, to the normal life. So these are a lot of cases that need also to be studied in the future. So for, for the future studies, one question is whether the symptoms observed in patients stem from the pure COVID-19 or whether the introduction of the virus into the body with pre-existing conditions will exacerbate the underlying disease to cause severe progression. Right now, there is no good you know, study design to really differentiate them, in particular for the elderly patients. So another important question is how best to detect and track the, the, chrono, uh, the, the, the chronic uh, neurological sequelae or consequences from these viral uh, infections. And what will be especially interesting is to analyze what are viral effects on brain in mild cases of COVID-19, <clears throat> about 80% of the total cases. For that, I think MR will play a critical role in evaluating the sub, uh, subtle you know, post-infection brain and the vascular changes, which uh, Dr. Hayes is going to uh, cover. Okay, I'm going to stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Yulin. Uh, uh, I invite Paolo uh, to introduce Professor Thank you, Robert. And last but not least is uh, Mark Aki. Uh, Mark is a past president and gold medal of uh, the International Society for Neurovascular Disease. And uh, speech is a comprehensive imaging protocol for neurological sequela in COVID-19 patients. Please, Mark. Thank you very much. 
Parlons. Thank you for you, Lynn, to have introduced um, perfectly the topic of my presentation today. There we go. So I'm going to focus more on the imaging aspects um, for COVID-19, neuroimaging in particular, since Mayun introduced the uh, body imaging and CT and, and PET MR for the lungs. So we know that COVID-19 has affected close to 10 million people with the fatality rate above 5%. And one of the key questions that really came to light not really that long ago, perhaps just two months ago, is what are the uh, what are the ramifications of the vascular problems associated with COVID-19 that lead to neurological deficits in those patients who have recovered? And given what Yulin just said about PTSD and depression, and you know all of these are neurological findings, and apparently in quite a large number of people. But even if only 10% of all of these people have uh, significant vascular, neurovascular problems, that's still well over a million people. And I think that we have to look at what's going to happen in the next one, two, and five years related to these patients. And over time, hopefully many of them will in fact get imaged. So COVID-19 appears to have a strong effect on the vascular system through the cytokine storm effect um, and the four different methods that Yulin spoke about. But particularly if the endothelium is compromised, it can cause ischemic injury, it can cause stroke from thromboembolic phenomena, and it can cause tissue damage from extravasated hemorrhagic products. So some have estimated for the more severe cases that up to about one third of the patients may be affected and a recent paper by Helms et al. in the New England Journal of Medicine has noted that a majority of patients had intracerebral hemorrhagic lesions of some type with the more severe clinical presentations. So we know something is happening along these lines. We just haven't imaged enough people to have good experience there yet. Hopefully that will change now as people begin to get back to business. So the neurological manifestations can include ischemic or hemorrhagic cerebrovascular disease, uh, cranial peripheral neuropathy, new onset of seizures or worsening of previous diagnosis in epilepsy, uh, also new onset or worsening of previous diagnosis of multiple sclerosis, impaired consciousness, cognitive deficits, worsening of previous cognitive deficits, as well as neuromuscular diseases, including myalgias, encephalomyelitis, myelopathy, sleep disturbances, headaches, agusia, nausea, ataxia, and dizziness. All of these have been reported by patients. So MRI offers a wonderful means by which to study the vascular system and, of course, how the tissue has been affected generally, including white matter hyperintensities. Flare imaging particularly can be used to detect inflammation, a technique, a, a rapid multi-contrast imaging technique called STAGE for strategically acquired gradient echo imaging can map out water content and T1 changes. MR angiography and what we call STAGE MRAV can be used to map out the vascular system. Susceptibility weighted imaging can be used to study the veins, uh, microbleeds and oxygen saturation. Quantitative susceptibility mapping can map out changes in iron content, and perfusion-weighted imaging can measure things like cerebral blood volume, cerebral blood flow, and mean transit time. And finally, microscopic effects can be seen through diffusion-weighted imaging, and all of these can be assessed using MRI. Stage imaging in particular is a means to acquire roughly 15 different pieces of information in a five minute scanning period so that COVID-19 patients could be imaged fairly quickly. And if we add T2 flare and DWI into this, the total scan time would be less than 10 minutes. 
Um, stage requires two gradient echo acquisitions, each two and a half minutes, and it covers the entire brain in 3D in five minutes. The types of images that we can get with stage include a spin density-like image on the left side, T1-weighted image on the right side, and by properly combining these data, we can produce a T1-weighted image on the right, which we call an improved or enhanced T1-weighted image. And this is important in terms of studying changes in tissue uh, behavior with these contrasts. Now we can also get quantitative maps. So we can look at mapping out the T1 values, which is the left image, mapping out the uh, water content. So here's the CSF, for example, which is 100% water, gray matter about 82% water, and white matter about 70% water. And these two are fully quantitative data. The image on the right-hand side is a T2-weighted scan. And it's, it's great because it shows abnormalities very well, but it's not quantitative. So both of these image, images here are quantitative and provide the same type of information as T2, but with quantitative data. So if we put all of this together, we can get 10 different images here that can be uh, collected in a five-minute scan. The lower images represent uh, SWI, both the left and this or another form of SWI called true SWI. Here you can look for microbleeds and changes in iron content. We can get R2 star maps. We can get uh, iron maps and quantitative susceptibility maps. And we can get what we call a poor man's MRA. It's just basically the MCA and circle of Willis. We'll come back and talk about better angiographic methods in a moment. And then if you add diffusion weighted imaging to this, and you can also get an ADC map from the DWI data, as well as flare images, either by 2D or by 3D, and you have a complete neuroimaging protocol of more conventional technology. Well, here's an example of applying this to a stroke case, which is related to the COVID-19 microbleeds as shown by Yulin earlier. So the left-hand image is for a hypertensive case showing the microbleeds with SWI. The middle image is the susceptibility weighted image. And the right-hand image is a, a new MRA technique I'm going to show you that eliminates the background brain tissue and leaves you with just the vascular information for looking at um, vascular-related and stroke-related problems, which is what I think we're seeing in COVID-19. Here's an example of another stroke case where you can see thrombosis, and I think that's going to be critical in COVID-19. This is a, a susceptibility-weighted image from a short echo time, so it doesn't show the veins. It just shows the thrombosis. This is an SWI from the long echo time that shows the veins and the thrombosis. In this particular case, the veins are seen to be asymmetrically uh, dark on one side, which is an indication of reduced perfusion in this entire hemisphere. And you can understand why the MRA now shows you that there is a blockage here uh, of the right middle cerebral artery. You can also use these methods to study the vessel wall to look for changes in the endothelium. Now, something else we can study using um, quantitative susceptibility mapping is the change in oxygen saturation. So the image on the left is qualitative data with susceptibility weighted image. The image in the center is an image of someone before drinking two cups of coffee. And the image on the right is after drinking two cups of coffee. And you can see that the oxygen saturation changes from 70% to 60%. So using this technology, one can monitor changes in oxygen saturation for the patient. Now, here's an example combining what I just showed you in a stroke case. On the right-hand side, you could see a mean transit time map. You can see there's an increased area here of slow flow to the brain, reduced perfusion, and you see that the venous signal becomes very dark. That's because the tissue is actually still functioning, but it's absorbing a lot of oxygen. So the veins become deoxygenated. After the patient has been successfully treated, this effect goes away. And now the tissue is behaving normally. This type of behavior we can also look for in COVID-19 patients. Here's a, an example combining now the, the, all four of these with diffusion-weighted imaging showing a local deficit, susceptibility-weighted imaging showing the entire hemisphere 
as a perfusion deficit, QSM quantifying the oxygen saturation, and now on the PWI, you can see the reduced cerebral blood flow here. So again, MR paints a complete picture of this for you. Now I'd like to go to what we call the stage MRAV sequence. It's a specialized sequence that basically removes the background tissue by collecting the data twice in an interleaved fashion. It gives you a black blood image and a bright blood image. And then by subtracting these, we end up with an image that has only blood vessels. This scan can be run as short as four minutes, but usually we run it at around six minutes for higher resolution. And here's an example for you um, from data collected in Tianjin Hospital in China. Here you can see a, a good case, again, this time a blockage of the left middle cerebral artery. We have the QSM data to go with it, the SWI data, the R2 star map. And now you can overlay the veins on top of the arteries in a single scan. So you can study the entire vasculature for COVID-19 patients. And this is in a six minute scan. Um, here's an example applying this with slightly higher resolution. And you can see that there's no brain left and you can evaluate all the vessels, including very small vessels. And please note, this is without a contrast agent. So we can apply all of this to COVID-19. Here's the same example that Dr. Gush showed from Henry Ford Hospital from the paper by Poyaji et al. Um, here they can show the, the white matter hyperintensities using flare and T2. Here on SWI, you can see multiple microbleeds that have taken place uh, throughout the thalamus in this case. And you, you can see that MR offers the potential to study the entire vascular system this way. So in conclusion, using these imaging methods, we can collect information on inflammation, changes in flow, perfusion, thrombus, microbleeds, and vascular deficits. And imaging these patients should make it possible to correlate vascular damage with neurological outcomes, determine if microbleeds are more prevalent than thrombi in COVID-19 patients, ascertain what age groups suffer the most, determine if there is a race or sex dependence, and determine which patients will best benefit from treatment with heparin if coagulopathy is the issue. And finally, in the future, we believe it will be critical to image and map vascular damage and microbleeds in recovered COVID-19 patients who have neurological sequelae. MR imaging measures are likely to be correlated with functional outcomes relevant to these neurological deficits. So our goal in general should be to show that the vascular pathology is able to predict the severity of these clinical neurological dysfunctions. Thank you very much. Paolo, uh, you are muted. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Very interesting presentation. Wonderful images as usual. So I think that uh, Robert, we may go to the to the discussion because I see a lot of questions from uh, uh, in the webinar. And yeah, then we I think we should. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Let's I start. Uh, let's have the uh, Neve to start the uh, you know the Q and A and uh, panel discussion session. Neve, are you there? Yes. Uh, good morning. Good afternoon, and good evening to all our audiences. Uh, this was a wonderful set of four um, speeches, talks on this uh, pandemic we are all facing. I'd immediately introduce our four panelists, um, well, myself, uh, Nivedi Dagarwal. I'm working in the hospital of Rovereto in northeast of Italy. I'm a neurologist and neuroradiologist. I also have the pleasure here to introduce Professor Korivu. He is a program director of neurodegeneration at National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke. Thank you for being here with us. Uh, we have uh, Professor Alireza Radmanesh. Um, he has written some beautiful papers on uh, neuro neurological uh, MRI lesions in, uh, in COVID-19, Assistant Professor and Director of Pediatric Neuroradiology in the Department of Radiology at New York City uh, Grossman School of Medicine. Uh, we have Professor Toro. He is an Emeritus Professor of Mathematics at the University of Trento in Italy. 
and formerly a full professor of numerical analysis at the same university. Uh, of course, Professor Paolo Zamboni and Professor Robert Zivadino that have been introduced early. So let me quickly uh, open the discussion for the panelists. Uh, really, it is a question for all of them, but let me ask Professor Corrigo to start first. Um, what do you think would be the role of MR brain imaging in, relation, in, in survivors of COVID-19 patients? Is there a, a role of a follow-up MR in such patients? I think you were asking me? Yes, Professor. Oh, sorry. Oh, Go ahead, thank Robert. you. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. Uh, it's such a pleasure to be here. A wonderful seminar and, and very um, informative for me. So it has a it has a very significant role. I, I was I was um, and I was sort of impressed to, to see everything that's been done so far, and I was also impressed by you know what remains to be done. And I, I had a, a a number of questions. Well, certainly, uh, MRI imaging has has an important role, and my 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 question for the the speakers and the group about that is, uh, given the role that MRI imaging uh, will play, uh, it seems even more important and critical than ever to look to, uh, to look at MRI as biomarkers and think about biological and instrumental validation of MRI in a way that, that the data obtained uh, can be, can, can cross cut uh, across the community and, and in and in addition to really wonderful studies that are contained, but be the information be transportable and comparable across studies. So, uh, so I, I would be interested in some discussion about, about that. Uh, Professor Radmanesh, did you want to add something to this? Uh, sure, hello everyone. And um, congratulations to the organizers of the um, webinar, it was uh, fantastic. A great lineup of speakers and very good material presented. Um, so I think Dr. Corivo said it beautifully. You know, um, many groups have done a fantastic job in describing uh, the different phenotypes that uh, many of the COVID patients uh, show. Uh, the jury is still out, though, as to which of these phenotypes are casual associations and which of them are causal associations uh, when we speak of uh, COVID patients. As, as important as autopsies are, and, and um, our um, great speaker from Italy um, um, spoke on that, uh, you know, the limited data that we have from autopsy and CSF analysis hasn't really shown direct evidence of presence of virus in, uh, in the brain or in the cerebrospinal fluid. And if we assume that that is true and that is not going to change, we have to believe that we are dealing either with uh, a para-infectious process, uh, similar to what we see in patients with influenza or uh, herpes virus or other types of viruses, or we are dealing with a vascular phenomenon. And it seems like more and more evidence is pointing towards the vascular um, underpinning of the processes that we are watching in the brain. In terms of what can actually lead to the uh, presumed vasculopathic condition looks like you know we are dealing with a few different hypotheses. Um, one is that these patients get prone to development of thrombus, and it has been shown that many of them develop either um, stroke or venous sinus thrombosis. Another idea is that the endo endothelium of the vessels is affected by the inflammation and the cytokine storm that was discussed during the during this uh, speaks. Um, and, and the other possibility is that maybe the endothelium gets directly invaded and injured by the, by the virus. Interestingly, there was an, a paper in Lancet recently published that got everyone excited uh, because they did electron microscopy and they suggested that they saw virus particles 
inside the endothelium, but unfortunately it got a little undermined after another uh, commentary came out and criticized the electron microscopy interpretation because apparently the initial group was misinterpreting the rough endoplasmic reticulum as the virus particles. So the true, uh, truth of the matter is we really don't have any evidence, any substantive evidence that there is direct invasion of the endothelium. So we, we are, for now, uh, stuck with inflammation versus throm throm thrombophilia as the potential vascular etiologies for these changes. But I think that the way forward is really to use the tools in our toolbox uh, as neuroimagers, both perfusion tools and functional tools, to get a better understanding of what is going on. Professor Toro, did you have something to add? Uh, please unmute yourself, Tito. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay, so my question here, uh, my comment to begin with, is with the statement that the evidence that we have in front of us, even if limited, points to the fact that we have a profoundly altered uh, vascular system, in particular altered hemodynamics, that is to say blood flow in the systemic circulation and pulmonary circulation. Perfusion is an issue. And one aspect only, there are several aspects here, but one is blood viscosity. If you think of uh, viscosity in blood, a, a viscosity can come from viscosity in the plasma, but fundamentally from the form elements, uh, red blood cells, for example, that form the, ma the majority of the form elements. So hematocrit. Now hematocrit, now the viscosity there is reasonably well characterized because one knows the mechanical properties of red blood cells the aggregation and the formation characteristics and so on. Now we have a new uh, issue here, which is, uh, which is uh, thrombi. Now thrombi within the vessels can be seen as an addition to form elements. That means you are going to alter the blood viscosity tremendously because you might see this as an increased hematocrit. And uh, viscosity goes up very steeply with uh, hematocrit. Now, having an increased viscosity in blood, eh, no wonder you're going to have perfusion problems. So you have a, a, a vascular system that is not actually doing its job, which is to perfuse the body and the tissue for a simple reason, viscosity, but there are several more, of course. There is a damage to the vessel wall, for example, extravasation of content from the vessel wall and so on. But viscosity alone is an issue. And of course, it's very difficult to characterize viscosity in this patient because we don't know what the properties of this uh, uh, thrombi are in terms of mechanical properties, aggregation, deformation, and so on. Control, vascular control mechanisms are probably also disabled or disrupted, so they cannot compensate for the failure of a, of a a, of a, of in, in the vascular system due to increased increase viscosity. Concerning the brain, we are going to have the same situation in particular, and we know, at least in this community of the International Society for Neurovascular Diseases, that a altered hemodynamics means altered dynamics of other fluid compartments in the brain, a cerebrospinal fluid, ISF, the, the, the hypothesized glymphatic system. So what is actually going on there? What are the pressure values within the vessels in the brain, in the venous system, in the, uh, in the arterial system, for example? So my, uh, my question here for the speakers would be uh, uh, to say in what way uh, bodily fluid dynamics framework a bodily fluid dynamics framework could contribute to research in, in COVID-19. 
Well, uh, I think I would invite Professor Zamboni and uh, Professor Zivadinov to answer um, the questions raised by Professor Toro. Uh, we know that we uh, do give anticoagulants to these patients so that uh, you know, there is a certain um, increase in the fluidity of blood uh, in these patients, but we also know that these, this can uh, increase the risk of hemorrhage in these patients as well. What is your opinion about this? Professor Zivadina, Robert? I mean, I did not have uh, really an experience uh, yet to, with that, uh, but uh, I think that uh, certainly uh, uh, there have been some reports already published uh, which show that there is uh, advantage of uh, proceeding with anticoagulation therapies in this patient. So I would be definitely pro anticoagulation, uh, even with a high risk uh, for uh, uh, hemorrhages. Uh, I think that's my stance. I think that uh, uh, certainly uh, respect to what everybody contributed today, it's uh, extremely important uh, to follow this uh, uh, patients uh, post-COVID, uh, especially those who had neurological sequelae, uh, because uh, really they may uh, f further, uh, you know, shoot the microblades, etc. We don't know whether uh, uh, the fact that uh, there is uh, really no COVID anymore in the blood will have the same effect in the CNS. Uh, I don't know if Paolo wants to add. Uh, Paolo? Yes. Uh, what uh, uh, Christopher Pomara uh, showed us uh, uh, this uh, afternoon in Italy, uh, I think it's very impressive because it seems that the hematogenous uh, path is the, if, uh, if the route of the virus to the central nervous system. He showed uh, evidences of this passage through the blood uh, barrier. So I don't think that uh, uh, it is so important to study the hemodynamic of the CSF flow, although uh, in case uh, of uh, uh, thrombosis of the sinus of, of the vein, certainly this uh, will be modified, but this is a, a side effect of the invasion and of the uh, coagulation activation on behalf of the virus in the, in the veins of the, of the brain. So, I don't think is a, a, a primary a primary mechanism of the hemodynamics of the CSF in case of uh, of uh, COVID nineteen uh, uh, disease. At least now with the data uh, with the first data we have. Okay. Uh, well, excellent. Let me ask um, Professor Zivadinov to read out some questions that our audiences have asked us so far. So there are a couple of questions for Dr. Pomara. Dr. Pomara, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Perfect, we can't see you, but you're there, okay. So there is a question for you from, um, from the audience. One of it is, what were your pathological findings in the heart? Our M because their MRI study indicates that there is myocardial edema. Yes. Yes. <clears throat> okay. Uh, general, uh, um, I the myocardium is not uh, always involved, but definitely yes, we had some case with myofibrillar edema and uh, myofibrillar hemorrhage. Uh, which is very important, but we need to understand that because, uh, as I told, and uh, as it was outlined, we have a um, small numbers of autopsy. Uh, when we are talking about the heart, obviously we need to think that this, the, those are patients coming, you know, from the EQ, so I, I see you. So 
uh, definitely we don't know if the lesion, so the edema as well as the hemorrhage between the fibers is related directly to the action of the virus or is an indirect effect of the uh, procedure of resuscitation uh, uh, during the intensive care. Obviously it's very important and that's because uh, I used to um, underline the useful and the help of the immunohistochemical study which I think, uh, to respond to the other question, I think is more appropriate than the electronic microscopy. Uh, I think that uh, we need to mark with the correct antibody. Uh, now there is the antibody anti-COVID-19, and some study demonstrate, has demonstrated the presence uh, even in the, in the myocardic uh, uh, fibers, uh, but once again, we need to understand if it's a primary lesion or if it's a subsequent lesion uh, of the of the help that they're receiving in the uh, intensive care unit. Um, for the virus, uh, uh, as I as I showed to you, to all of you, we have a reaction with the CD8. If we have a reaction with CD8. Uh, then the virus is inside the brain. Uh, if it's inside the endothelium, um, uh, honestly, uh, during this day, we will start with an, some experiments with another type of microscopy, which is not the electronic, which is the confocal mm, microscopy, because we have the chance with the confocal microscopy to perform uh, the immunohistochemical study with the monofluorescence. So, uh, probably, uh, and, and I hope to have the results, but uh, honestly, it's, uh, it's really hard uh, to have uh, the answer now, but what is very important is the reaction of the CD in the, in the brain tissue. Um, as far as I know, <clears throat> In New England Journal, it was presented uh, case, case studies of 19 patients, and for example, about the, the symptoms, uh, it was demonstrated that there no was any, uh, you know, nerve damage uh, on the uh, optical as well as the uh, acoustic nerve, but uh, uh, they have. The, the presentation of the virus in the frontal lobe, for example, in the cerebellum, so uh, diffuse one. And that's because I suppose that there is uh, the uh, intervention of the vascular, microvascular system that probably help to disseminate the virus everywhere in our body. And that's because we need to study all the organ. And, you know, if we have 4% of study of the vascular system, or can we hypothesize something? So we need to increase our study on the gross examination and the histological examination on the vascular system, the peripheral as well as the central. It is something that Professor Kumara, I'll ask you very uh, two more questions, but you have to be really telegraphic. Very short answers because it's just this is in the interest of time. The one question is uh, actually by Professor Cory Moore. He he asks what would be considered the minimal needed assessment in terms of brain pathology as part of the autopsy to move COVID nineteen signs of the brain forward. What? what is the minimal needed assessment to um, to assess brain pathology? To understand science, what is the minimum that we can do to understand? Mm, for me, for me, there is no way. We have to study all the brain according all the gross examination, lobe per lobe, and then... so. So uh, this is Rod Corivo. I, I want to say, I mean, I, I'm. Uh, it's great if you answer that way, and that may be the truth. But but it's uh, you know, I, I'm. I was actually trying to tee up an opportunity to say something slightly more specific because there's no way to go possible saying we need to do everything. So if anybody ever asked me, I, I feel what you're bringing to the table is important. And if anybody ever asks me as a, as a program director uh, saying, well, we agree it's important, what should we do? And I say everything, they're gonna turn and walk away and say, think about it more. So no. you don't have to answer now, but but it's just something that I, I wanted to make an opportunity for you, not 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 anything else. 
Oh, thank you. <laughs> no I think the thing to do would be to really collect uh, systematically the CSF samples uh, with lumbar puncture. I think that would be the first step uh, in that direction. Thank you. Yeah. So last question for Professor Broad for Dr. Kumara is a question from Dr. Hakey. He asks, does heparin protect against COVID-19 passing through the endothelium? I'm not a clinician, but, okay. uh, but, but you know, probably everything that can protect, you know, the, that can promote uh, an antithrombotic action can help uh, us, as well as uh, everything that can promote the endothelium, some uh, pharmaceutical product, uh, so anti-tablets, for example, agents probably, yes, can help. The problem is, you know, to start quickly with the therapy, to understand. Okay. Thank you very much. I have a couple of questions for Dr. Guy. Yulen, you there? You need to unmute yourself. Okay, yes. so the question is, how would ACE2 triggering differentially affect male and female patients? And could this account for differences in susceptibility and severity? Do you know if there's a gender difference? Yeah, I think it's a good question, but I'm, I don't know exact answer. Because I know, I mean, from several large uh, population study, the male is definitely higher patients in terms of number. And for example, in the New York, uh, uh, you know, the city large study uh, with uh, five uh, with uh, five thousand and seven hundred patients, like two third are men. But uh, in terms of the ACE two receptor distribution between the gender, I don't know. But definitely the pre-existing, you know, the vascular comorbidity is higher than in men than the women. So if there is um, additional difference uh, with the ACE2 receptor distribu distribution, that's going to probably give you um, another, yeah. you know, the, uh, uh, the factor of the, uh, you know, why man uh, has, uh, you know, more, uh, you know, vascular, um, you know, the uh, complications or the comorbidities. Mm -hmm. All right, there's another question for you, Dr. Yi. Uh, by targeting ACE2 receptor, could it interfere with its normal function? Wouldn't it be better to target the S protein, the spike protein of the virus to block its replication? So because the binding site is, you know, the S protein by the uh, ACE2 receptor, you, um, I mean, there's different ways, I think. I'm not, you know, the, uh, the uh, expert on the, uh, you know, treatment or the, uh, the, uh, the medicine, but uh, they, this is kind of the theory uh, right now still. Uh, it's on the exploration, uh, whether the block the, um, the receptor can, um, you know, reduce the side effects from this virus. Right. Uh, there have been a few questions for Professor I Wong. Mean, uh, just, just to that, you know, there were a couple of studies published on use of AC inhibitors, right? Uh, in, in hypertensive patients uh, where originally the risk was uh, reported as higher, but then some studies show that actually those who take ACE inhibitors have a lower risk uh, for complications. So I think it's an open argument. Uh, also, another point that I wanted to make, you know, uh, respect to the pathways as you showed, Yulin, which was wonderful, uh, probably the therapies should be tailored because you are not going to, for example, attack the cytokine uh, storm you know, with heparin, uh, you are going to attack it probably with dexamethasone, as we learned from, from Oxford. So clearly, our approaches should also be fair respect to the way how the virus is. Yes, yeah, that's, that's a good comment, uh, the Robert. So I think if the, regarding your first comment, uh, the, uh, the ACE inhibitor, I think the ACE and the ACE2 is different. So the uh, ACE E inhibitor uh, works on the uh, ACE, but the AC the ACE2 works on the uh, you know the uh, angiotensin 2. So they are they are kind of totally uh, different uh, enzyme. 
and, and the, regarding the um, your uh, the, the second uh, the the comment. Uh, so um, sorry, what was your second comment? The the the, the pathways uh, that you oh, presented yeah. should be also. Yeah, that's also a very interesting question. So I talked with uh, you know Dr. Radmanish uh, the other day. So you know from his paper, you know we can see at early age, at early stage, like two weeks after the infection, the the people um, only showed you know the the pre-existing cardio you know the vascular um, comorbidity uh, worsening, and uh, but not really. Uh, the, the virus induced the changes, but after you know the uh, in the advanced you know stage, especially the uh, critical you know the uh, ill you know patients in the ICU with the ventilation like uh, you know twenty days, twenty five days, and uh, there the blood oxygen is still not normal, so that gives you a time window like a chronic hypoxia. This chronic hypoxia causing diffuse and patchy the white matter hyperintensity, showing you know the several slides I showed on the EWI, and also there's a cell swelling indicated by the reduced diffusivity on the ADC map. So that's kind of very interesting because uh, you know at early age the hypoxia we know the the COVID patients all have hypoxia because they're lung has problems, right? So, but uh, at early age, that hypoxia may not directly cause severe neuronal damage because that hypoxia, actually, there is a compensatory, compensatory you know, the mechanism which increased, can cause increased blood flow you know, with the visual dilation. But after several weeks during this hypoxia, not you know, totally like a, acute infection with, you know, the thrombi in the major arteries, there's no flow in, in going to the brain. This is, there is still flow, there is still an oxygen going there, but not you know, enough, you know, the high enough the oxygen to meet the demand of the neuronal, you know, the metabolism. So this is why there is, you know, the, the white matter happiness that we see diffuse and patchy, and also there's a pathological problem we think is a demyelination and also the uh, kind of some uh, axonal uh, damage too. So, and also interestingly, those, the pathology mainly see in the white matter, not the gray matter, like, uh, you know, acute infection and acute thrombosis, we see both gray matter and white matter in the ter in territory based, you know, the, the changes, but those, you know, the core, you know, hypoxia related changes in the white matter member. Do you have any more to add, uh, Eddie? Yeah, um, I, I think you, you pointed it out um, exactly right. Um, our experience was suggesting that in the early phase of disease, we have more of large vessel problem. Uh, most of the issues that we saw in the first month or, or particularly in the first two weeks of the disease, it was either macro hemorrhage or areas of infarct. Um, however, when we looked at it in the, towards the end of the second month of pandemic, uh, especially with the epicenter at that time in New York City, in patients who had been at ICU for a while, then we started seeing more of a microvascular uh, complications. When there was hemorrhage, hemorrhages were micro hemorrhage. And when we talked about ischemia, we were talking about the delayed post hypoxic demyelination, which is a small vessel ischemia affecting the oligodendrocytes um, and the turnover of the myelin. So it looks like we're dealing with a vascular process which in the early stages macrovasculature and in the late stages is microvasculature. Yes, well, we're fine. Yes, um, well, excellent. Um, I don't have any more questions here. Um, is so there maybe, anybody see else? If other panelists have questions to the speakers or to the other panelists. Anyone else has questions? Um, 
if not um, if not uh, then uh, i think that uh, paolo and i should call for yulin to close this and mayun uh, mm -hmm. close the uh, this really very successful uh, webinar yeah i would like to you know to thank all for your participation and all your contribution uh, to this uh, you know webinar so hope you know we can you know discuss uh, you know many uh, things uh, in this way in the future, and I think it's more economic and more convenient, and uh, also involved. You know, also I mean not really in person, but also the face-to-face -face, uh, discussion. I think this is very good. So, um, maybe do you want to uh, say something? Yeah, I would like also to thank all the speakers and the um, panelists, the guests, uh, to share your. Um, your findings, your comments, and your opinions, they are very helpful. And also, I would like to thank the attendees uh, through, uh, around the world. And also, actually, uh, thousands of attendees in China have uh, attended our meeting by scanning the code and watching the live. So uh, I think and, um, in the future, we will put the record in the, some new media platform and so more and more uh, people will watch our meetings uh, that would be a great thing so thank you very much for all your effort and support and help okay thank you guys and uh, you. stay well take care thank you thank you bye 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 bye, bye. bye. Thank you. bye. bye.